sin. I'm so thankful for what God has done for us. We're glad you're here today. If you have your Bibles, open to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12 this morning. Man, what a, what a beautiful day outside, a beautiful day inside. I'm glad to be at church today. If you're glad to be at church, say amen. amen. If you're still awake, say amen. amen. Well, we can take care of that in the next 20 minutes. And uh, I remember once I had a teacher in high school, and she had this deal. She goes, well, if I put you to sleep, I get to wake you back up. I remember the time, I don't know if my parents know this, mom, plug your ears. Uh, I remember the time one of my, my friends fell asleep, and she came and kissed him on the forehead and woke him back up. I promise you I will not kiss you on the forehead. Oh, don't say aw. Oh. Wow, that's scary. But... <laughs> Uh, but I promise you I'll put you to sleep. Okay, how's that part? Uh, no, Mark chapter 12, I'm glad to be here. And I'm missing pastors out preaching today. And uh, just some things about that as we go through this transition. March, or March, May 19th will be pastor's last service here. And there's some things that I want to do as a church for him and will encourage us to do. And uh, one thing I'd like to do is I'd like to be able to give him quite a large gift as he, as he departs the ministry right here at First Baptist Church. And so it'd be good right now as through Christmas and through these holidays to begin to set some money aside, I'd like to present him a large check. Now, you say, well, how large is large? I think we couldn't do anything that would be oh, too much over the top for a man who has invested 44 years here in Saginaw, Michigan. All right, it'd be awesome. I'd love, I'd love it if we could, if we could give him $44,000. That'd be awesome. 1,000 for every year. You're like, wow, that's, that's crazy. It, you know, there, there, I heard of a church the other day that the pastor was stepping down and they cut him a, a small check for $200,000. For $200, that's a large check. We don't have that money, so don't even think. And, and I, I like it from the people of First Baptist Church. My wife and I will begin to set some money aside for him for that day. So just you get a heads up on that so we don't come to May and you're like, oh, I didn't even know about it. I'll talk about it more, some things that they, I, I want to be special. Um, I've been asked on that service that day, well, what, what will we do? And there's some things that I want to do from a church perspective. And really that day, Pastor said, that's, that's, I'm going to plan out that day for him. He's not going to plan out his own you know, uh, resigning day, okay? And he wouldn't do that. He's not that type of guy. And so I'm going to plan out some things for him. And it's really about our church and him. All right, he's had a lot of ministry outside the church and a lot of men that said they may come for that service, but I'm focusing on, on these people here. So Pastor Dylan may come and ask you to give a testimony. All right, and if he does, do me a favor and record that for him. And there's some of you who've been around a long, long time. I think that'd be real special to get some thoughts. We'll write some letters for us some things along the way we're doing for him. But I'm... Um, Looking forward to honoring him, and of course, he'll still be around. We love him very much, and so I love Pastor, and what a, what a man of God. And really, this church would not be here short of three people, all right? The Lord. Can I get an amen? amen. Are you asleep already? Okay. The Lord wasn't in this, this church would not be here. All right, if Pastor Alette was not here, this church would not be here. All right, his faithfulness, his consistency, his stand for the Lord and for soul winning, and if his wife Christy wasn't there. All right, without those three people, this church, now, many other people, members, of course, but those three people, uh, the Lord, followed by pastor and his wife, and so I'm glad. Uh, but moving on, Mark chapter 12 this morning, Mark chapter 12, another account in the life of Christ. We're on storms for a little bit, now just taking a slight detour, and tonight I'll be preaching on grace, and so that song that he sang fit right into my message tonight. Brother, thanks, Brother Goldsworthy, you just set the stage. If you want to hear that message, you've got to come back tonight. Um, but Mark chapter 12, and it's an account where some people came again and tried to trick Jesus. If you, if you read through the Gospels, you'll notice that often they're trying to come and trick Jesus. All right, they're trying to stump the Lord. All right, they're trying to, and, and they're, they're trying all these different ways. They're thinking, we got all these good questions that there's no way that Jesus can answer them. All right, there's no way because we're a lot smarter than he is. But they weren't. They weren't smarter than Jesus. All right, they never were smarter than Jesus. But they thought they were. Isn't that funny? I know some people who think they're smarter than Jesus. I know some Christians who think that they're smarter than Jesus because they look at what Jesus says, they're like, nah, that's not the best way. I know a better way. I'm smarter than Jesus. What you'll find out that we're never smarter than Jesus, it should go without saying, but in Mark chapter 12, verse number 14, and when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true and carest for no man. Now, that word cares, just to, just to explain that briefly, it does not mean that he didn't care about anybody. You can't read about the life of Christ and not realize that he cared for people, did not care about how much they made or what race they're from, did not matter. He cared about people, and he still loves it. The Bible says that, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. 
And they're not saying, you don't care about people, you don't have any compassion. What they're saying is, you, you don't care what people say about you. Right? You, you, you just do what you think is right. And that's a great testimony to have. I hope the people who you work with know that you care for no man. You do what's right. I hope your family, your wife, or your husband, your kids know that you're someone who doesn't care as for people, not that you don't care about them, but that you do what's right and you care more about God than what other people say. And they said, Master, we know this, that you're not, you're not afraid to say the hard things. You're not afraid to take a stand. You're not afraid to make people upset with you because you're saying what's true. Or thou carest for no man. For thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Then they pop this question, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye, bring me a penny that I may see it. You see, they were hoping to trap him. They obviously, the, the Jews were under the rule of the Roman Empire at this time, and Caesar was a god in the Roman Empire. Caesar was the ruler of the entire empire, and no one could speak against Caesar without fearing for his life. And so they thought, this will be perfect. We obviously, Jesus claims to be of God. He claims to follow God the Father, so that if he says it's lawful to give to Caesar, well, we know that's not lawful because God wouldn't want that. And if he says it's not lawful to give to Caesar, we've trapped him, we'll get him taken to court, get him executed, and we're done with this problem, this nuisance called Jesus. But Jesus, as it said, knew their hypocrisy, and he said, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. Verse number 16. And they brought it, and he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said to him, Caesar's. You have to wonder if uh, at this point they knew something was wrong. Right? I often wonder that in these stories, at what point they knew it was going to be a bad deal. At what point did they realize they'd been gotten? All right, you know, all of us have had these times in our life when we're trying to do something, all of a sudden we realize that what we're trying to do is not going to work out. Okay, the, uh, for a while, my wife tried to throw me a surprise party. And she always says that I can't be surprised, and that's not true, all right? That, that I, don't, I don't search for surprises. If you try to do something that's a surprise, I'm not the guy to, like, search through the house for presents, okay? I'm not, I just, okay. But for whatever reason, I usually know if that thing's about to happen. And my wife had invited people, and she had not told anybody. And, uh, but, but unfortunately, um, it was on my mom's schedule, okay? And my mom's, I think it was your Palm Pilot, had broken. She goes, J.D., can you fix my Palm Pilot? So I fixed it, and I saw, oh, party for J.D. You know, well, <laughs> who knew? <laughs> I wasn't, you know. And so we went to the party, and I saw that, and I instantly knew, okay, she's probably going to plan a surprise, or this is happening, okay? So I went there, and, and, uh, and I, I mean, I acted surprised. I did my best acting job I thought ever. And then my wife asked me the, the worst question ever, did you know about this? Now, ladies, let me help you here, okay? If you don't want the answer to the question, don't ask the question. <laughs> all right, men, don't ask the question. It's the same thing, all right? But she asked the question. And I didn't lie to her. I said, well, I did. How did you know? Oh, I tried so hard. I told her. She goes, oh, my goodness. Okay. I can't believe it. Uh, along those same lines, this last birthday, she wanted to surprise me again. Okay. She has this thing about wanting to surprise me. And so she, she decided to get this, the, the gun, the CPL class from Sheridan Arms on Titabawasi. I think it's Titabawasi Road. All right. I'm never out there. I don't go out that far. All right. That's danger zone for me. Okay. That's way too far. It's over 10 miles away. Well, it just so happened, okay, that she went and paid for this thing like on a Monday. That Thursday, I had an appointment at Sheridan Arms to get some donations for our outdoor night. Okay, so she sees it. Our schedules are linked. She sees the schedule. She's like, they're going to say something about it. So she calls over there the morning. She goes, don't say anything about this to my husband coming in. So I'm in the store. I know nothing, all right? I know nothing. And um, I, you know, talked to him, and the guy wasn't there, so I had to come back. And one of the guys there says, oh, yeah, your wife was in here earlier this week. I mean, just like that to me. And I, I'm telling you, I didn't believe it. I'm like, no, no, no. I said, it was not my wife. Oh, yeah, you're, you're one of the pastors of First Baptist Church, right? I said, yeah, 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 your wife was in here earlier this week. And honestly, I'm like, no, this guy, this guy has no clue who I am, all right? What, I'm thinking, why would my wife be shared in arms? All right, so the next week, a week later, uh, two weeks later, maybe it was my birthday, my wife asked me, she goes, did you know? I don't know why she asked me that question. She, and I said, honey, I had no idea. I said, but let me tell you a story. <laughs> And so I told her, and, and she's like, I knew. And I said, honey, honestly, though, I never for a moment put those two things together. 
And, uh, but um, I wonder at what point in this they knew that, that Jesus had, had kind of had got their number. He said, whose image is on this penny? Maybe they didn't know yet. They said to him, Caesar's. I'd like to think at this point they didn't know because if you'd know what happened, you wouldn't say Caesar. You'd just say, I don't know, and you walk away. But they walk right into Caesar's. And then Jesus makes this statement, and Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Read this phrase a few months back, and it really caught me. This is one of those profound phrases. There are a few of them in life. There are some phrases that are, that are very, very plain. For instance, pick up your toys. Very, very plain phrase. You are speeding. Very, very plain phrase. But this phrase is a profound phrase. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It's what I would call like a seed thought. It's a thought that is planted in our minds and over time we begin to assimilate and, and figure out what he's really saying here. And he's saying a whole bunch in this answer to their question. And this morning with God's help, I want to look at this, this idea, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God's the things that are God's. Or really, what are you giving away? What are you rendering? What are you giving away? Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this time. I pray to give us help and strength. Lord, help us to identify areas that we are not giving the right things away. Lord, may we give to you what you deserve, what would honor you. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. You see, in life will always be times that we give the wrong things away. Have the wrong priorities. I was reading about a, a man and a wife and they declared bankruptcy. The year before they declared bankruptcy, they had made $91,000. Now, $91,000 is not a lot of money. But it is a good amount of money. Someone here would say, no, no, Pastor Hall, that's a lot of money. I only make $45,000, so 91 would be a whole lot of money. Now understand something, if you went from forty-five dollars to $90,000, your life would not change that much with an extra $50,000 a year. You would probably have a little bigger house. You can't afford a mansion of $91,000. You'd probably drive a little newer car, maybe take one or two more vacations. But other than that, you don't have unlimited money. You're not going to Europe every other day at $91,000 a year. They had $91,000, they declared bankruptcy because they had over $70,000 in unsecured debt. They had a $400,000 home, and at the time of their bankruptcy, they had, I believe it was $6 in one savings account and $3 in the other savings account, and $860 in checking. So all in all, under $900. They had the wrong priorities. They gave away the wrong things. But I see in our life that we often have the wrong priorities. We have the wrong order. I notice first in this, in this command or this question from Jesus, I notice something that's not there. The verse is rendered under Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. But let me tell you something that's not there, and it may be a different order on the screen, so just if you can jump ahead with me, guys. Um, the first thing that I notice that's not there is that this ignores individuals. It, you notice that in this verse, it does not say, render to JD the things that are JD's, and then to Caesar, and then to God. I, I think if you look in this verse, and look in the Greek, and, and look in the Latin Vulgate, I don't care what you're looking, you're not going to find yourself in this verse. But look down there, do, do you see yourself mentioned? You're not going to find, it's not there. You say, well, why is that, you know, Brother Howell? Well, obviously, because, because I am not important. You are not important. But yet, how do we treat life in life? You know who's number one usually? Me. Number one for you? You. It doesn't say render yourself what you need, then to Caesar, then to God. In fact, you yourself are not mentioned at all. From early on, we battle these thoughts with children. And this idea that we, to ignore myself opposes current thinking. In fact, in life... In life and outside, the thoughts are, you take care of you. Make sure you give yourself a rest day. Give yourself a hug and a pat on the back. You deserve a break. I don't find that in the Bible, do you? I don't. It's, it opposes current thinking. In fact, I read an article yesterday on a blog. The title of the blog was, Why I Stopped Helping People. 
And then the blog, this man went on to say that I stopped helping people because it just became too burdensome in my life to help people. And it was just not putting me in a good position. Who was he consumed with? Help me. Himself. But you'll find people all around you, and we're all guilty of it, that we put ourselves first and we make sure that I have what I need. It opposes my thinking. Not only is it current thinking, it opposes my thinking. I think about myself. You think about yourself. When you say it this way, I like me and you like you. You may have a problem, but my problem is a bigger problem than your problem. All this hit this past week because <clears throat> Thursday morning I had a problem that I didn't want to have. Now I hate these problems. I got out of the shower, I flushed the toilet, and I heard the gurgling sound. And the toilet wasn't going down as quick as I wanted to go down. And of all life's problems, sewer and septic problems are the bane of my existence. Can I just say that when I flush the toilet, I want that gone forever? I don't ever want to see it again. I want it to, to disappear. I don't care where it goes, just not here. So I had some liquid fire at the house, so I poured some liquid fire uh, down the drain. It's, if you don't have liquid fire, you need to find some, all right? They sell it in a plastic bag. You have to wear gloves. It's very dangerous stuff, and it's for those emergency situations when what you want gone to be gone forever. Came back that evening after school before our open house here at the, at the school. And I said, hey, you know what? It's clean up, clean up everything, you know, and I'd plunge a toilet, and boy, it's, it's great. And took a quick shower, cut the grass, took a quick shower. I'm in the shower, and guess what I heard again? A gurgling sound. And I know, Houston, we have a problem. So I called, I'll tell you what, this is an unashamed plug for a company that I use called Dependable Sewer. You say, Brother Howell, why do you use them? I'll tell you why. About five, six years ago, at three o'clock in the morning, at my old house, I had a septic problem. They came at three in the morning to bail me out. And I have a little known truth in my life. You bail me out at three in the morning, you're my friend. Okay? <laughs> you bail me out at three o'clock in the morning with septic problems, you're my good friend. They only charged $85 that night. They made them a great friend. Okay? So I called them again. They came out Thursday night, and they solved my sewer problem. But you know what I was concerned about all night long in my mind? You know what I'm thinking about my mind? My stinking sewer at home. All right, it's a problem. And you could have brought a big problem. I'm like, oh, man, but my, my, my toilet's backing up. We're often consumed with our own problems. A few years back, I was cutting something, and I cut my finger. In fact, I still have a scar there, cut right to the bone. So one time I yelled at my wife. I was yelling for her, not at her. And I'm yelling, Doreen, Doreen. I'm yelling in the house, Doreen. She finally comes running from the garage. What is wrong with you? I said, look. And I'm so, you know, I'm like, she didn't come. I'm like, look what I did. And it just let it go, just bloods everywhere. She goes, what did you do to yourself? <laughs> Obviously, I cut myself. And after I got that bandaged up, <laughs> my, my, my daughter, Danielle, was real young then. She came up and she grabbed it with her finger. Not, not on purpose. It was accidental. I mean, she was about one or one and a half. Just grabbed it. I about went to the roof. I tried to sleep that night, the next couple nights, and the finger would just throb. And it's just a finger. All right? It's not, life's not over. I could cut off a finger and I could survive. But things throbbing and you can't sleep because it's just throbbing, throbbing, throbbing. We get consumed with ourselves. You get the point? We get consumed with our problems and our little own world, and we miss what God is trying to do. And there's nowhere in this verse that you're going to find yourself because it's not there, because that's not a priority in your life, and it should not be a priority. You see, Scripture commands me to put others first. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And God didn't identify myself as someone to give things to because I'm not a priority. But we often give ourselves a downtime. We give ourselves relaxation. We make sure that I've got what I need. We miss what God is trying to communicate here, this truth, this profound truth, that I'm not a priority. But see, not only is there, does it ignore individuals, it identifies responsibility. This verse identifies responsibility. There's that phrase, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar. You know, Jesus could have said, Resist Caesar. Jesus did not think that Caesar was a god. He did not worship Caesar like the Romans did. He did not support in that sense Caesar and his... But, but he did say this, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar. First of all, it implies government. This is not always a popular truth. It has to include taxes. That's what they're basically asking about, taxes. They didn't want to pay them. Now, thankfully, we've kind of walked through this. There are times in our 
fundamental Christian circles that people have gone on these tangents that, that, that we believe that we shouldn't pay taxes as Christians. Then they try to support it from the Bible, and I don't see it. Because I read this verse and I see, I have to pay taxes. I don't like to pay taxes, and I hope you don't either. Right? I'm not excited when the millages come up there. I'm not like, yes, more taxes. This is great. Like, I'm so excited. Render to Caesar. Yeah. But I'm thankful for them. I was living on the west side when I first came here to First Baptist Church. One night I got home and my door was not shut completely. I realized we've been broken into. And if you've ever been broken into, it's a horrible feeling. You felt like someone's been digging through your drawers. Everything's dumped on the floor. So I put my taxes to good use and I called 911. Hey, you know, someone broke into my house and sure enough, police came over and they said, well, you know, not much we can do. He's like, thanks a lot. What am I paying taxes for? Did they take anything? Well, not really. Paintball gun and 100 bucks, I think it was. And no one wants to pay taxes. No one wants to, no one wants that. But Jesus is clearly saying there are some things in government, all right, that we have to support. That, that are not sinful, all right, that are not against, against what God is saying. Now, there are some things they could ask us that we would not support. If they said you can no longer read the Bible, we'd say no way. No way. But if they say, you know what, this street is a one way, that's okay. How many old folks remember Fred Arndt? Man, Fred Arndt was a saint here. He was here when Pastor Let came. Died a few years back. I think it was 96 when he passed away. What a soul winner. He goes soul winning, I believe, twice a week. All right, maybe even three times a week. Man, he was a soul winner. But he was the worst driver known to man. All right, now, when guys came, I think Brother Edwards, you might have gone with Brother Arndt a few times, and he'd always tell Brother Arndt it was his turn to drive. I'm 22, 23. I couldn't do that to Brother Arndt. All right, he'd say it was his turn to drive. And this man who was a great soul winner, great servant of the Lord, all right, stop signs were merely just a suggestion. I don't think you could see them. He blew through them. I remember the one time we're on Hess Road, and there's a, the crossings, and there's another apartment complex right there. And he went from one to the other into oncoming traffic right in front of a bus. And I yelled, Brother Art, there's a bus. He whips off the road. He goes, whoo, whoo, whoo. That's good for my heart. <laughs> in that moment, I, I got to be honest, I, I said, but Brother Art, it's not good for my heart. <laughs> okay, I got to drive. He goes, oh, man. And we went, we went down the wrong, the wrong way on the one ways in Saginaw multiple times. Brother Art, it's the one way. Oh, sorry. Oh, man. But he wasn't doing it on purpose. He wasn't saying, forget, forget this. Though I know some people like that. Well, they can't tell me what to do. No, the Bible says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. There are some things that the government asks us to do that as a good Christian, Jesus is saying, listen, this is your responsibility. You ought to be faithful in those things. You ought to be a good citizen. Not only does it imply government, it's indicative of authority. And we live in a culture that wants to deny authority. We have young people who have never been told no, who don't understand authority in life. And anywhere we go, we have authority. Whether you like it or not, we have authority. You can't do what you want to do. It goes from the dress code at school all the way to where you work. There's some, uh, because I'm in the school scene, there's some schools out in California that have eliminated dress codes. Okay? What a mistake. Everywhere you go, you have a dress code. You can't work at Walmart and wear a Target shirt. They won't let you. They have a dress code. We get this. I, I, I taught the teens this a while back, but, but life is like boxes with authority. The box is pretty big in America. In America, we can go where we want to go when we want to go, can't we? If I want to go to Taco Bell for lunch, I can. But let's say I decide to go to Taco Bell for lunch, but I decide to drive across the field and across people's lawns at 120 miles an hour on my motorcycle. That'll be a problem, won't it? And let's say a police officer stops me, and he says, oh, you know, Mr. Howell, do you know how fast you're going? Yeah, I do 120. You know you're driving across the grass? Yeah, absolutely. It's a free country. Try and stop me. He probably will, will he not? And now my box that was big becomes smaller. Maybe he takes me off to jail and says, you know what, I don't like your attitude or you're breaking the law. And I say, you know, forget this little box of jail. Now I can't go where I want to go, right? I'm inside this jail. Well, let's say I break out of jail. They can't tell me what to do. I get back on my motorcycle, and I go 150 to Taco Bell, because I want Taco Bell really, really badly. Pulls me over again. Mr. Child, do you know how fast you're going? I do. The question is, do you know how fast I was going? 
They take me off to jail again, except this time I'm, I'm in a different place, right? The box is a little smaller. Let's say I break out of that one too and say, forget these boxes. They can't tell me what to do. Eventually I'll be in a little box for a long time, will I not be? The box gets smaller. We find out that as long as I stay inside that box, there's freedom in that box. If I drive on the road and drive the speed limit, I don't have any problems. I can go to Taco Bell twice if I want to. If I'm living life on the edge, I can go three times a day. Whew. And no one thinks anything of it. Yet this verse is indicative of authority in life, and we've got to train our children. Listen, there are real rules in life. We as adults need to understand there's actually authority in life. There's some, and it's okay to follow and submit to authority. Jesus is clearly saying, listen, there are some things that are commanded of you from Caesar. So render to Caesar, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Follow that authority. Be a good citizen inside of that little world, okay? Be a good citizen. At work, all right, follow the authority. If you're at work and you're on Facebook, you're stealing from your employer, right? You're stealing. And God wants us to be that good citizen, if you're working, you ought to be on time. All right, it's talking about authority in life. And we all have this natural inclination to put me first and to say, forget authority. To be transparent, I got pulled over two weeks ago. Well, three weeks ago now. Can I tell you this? I got pulled over. I was helping my wife. I had my van and a trailer on the back of it in Saginaw Township. Dangerous place. I'm going down the road, and I mean, I think it was Johnny maybe with me or James, one of the kids was with me. And they were going to the school to help Doreen with some stuff. And man, he behind me, turned those lights. I pulled him to Casey's funeral. Home. He goes, hey, how fast were you going? I said, 44 miles an hour. He goes, you were. I said, I know how fast I was going. He goes, you know, it's a 30 here. I said, officer, I didn't. I said, I thought it was a 45. I, and I, and before, I said, listen, in Bridgeport, most things are 45. There's one section 35. I wasn't even paying attention. I said, it was my bad. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I was going 44, though. He goes, oh, you're doing some painting. <laughs> I'm wearing painting clothes, and there's buckets of paint behind me. Yes, yeah. yeah, but no, no, I said, yes, yeah, yes, I do some painting over there. He goes, oh, I don't envy you. He goes, ah, I'll slow it down. He goes, uh, don't go, it's not 45. Right? I said, ah, thank you, sir. I said, did you say it was 50 over there? <laughs> he goes, no, 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 it was 30. But I want to be a good citizen. I wasn't trying to flaunt it. I, I, I saw the officer, right? But I don't want to be that guy to say, forget you. And God doesn't want us as Christians to be those people to say, forget you. There will be sometimes some things in life. All right, we have that issue where we could, they told us we couldn't pass out tracks. Then we ought to be faithful and diligent. We ought to pass out tracks. But on a lot of these things, we're just taking a stand, not because we love God, because we love ourselves. We want to say, forget you. We don't want to follow authority. Jesus is clearly indicating that there's authority to follow. And as a good Christian, we ought to be good examples toward authority. Your kids ought to be good examples toward authority. I just read uh, two days ago, there was a student who got in trouble in North Carolina because he referred to his teacher as yes, ma'am. And she didn't like that. He had to write it. Yes, ma'am, and give the definition. I like the fact for kids to say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, and yes, sir, and no, sir. It shows authority. And, and, it's, and we don't lose anything when we follow authority. We gain. See, God wants us to be a good citizen. But not only does it indicative of authority, but it implores worship. This verse implores worship. See, I think the most important part of this verse, and to God, the things that are God's. I don't find myself in this verse, but if I had to give a normal order of people, we would put ourselves first. We would put authority second, our job, the government, and we put God last. We let God fit in where he really just fit in in life. Somebody who will never be late to work, but late to church is no big deal. Somebody who will never miss their mortgage, but you know what? If my giving to the Lord, that's optional. And my boss may have to do this, and I'll do that, whatever my boss asked me to, to the nth degree, but Jesus asked me to give the gospel, and I, I don't do that. I think the most important part of this verse is this last part, render to God the things that are God's. You see, God wants my worship. Jesus said in John chapter 4, For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God wants people to worship him. Worship is not just an action. 
It's not where we turn the lights down and wave our arms, oh, now I'm worshiping God. It's when my heart's turned toward God and I say, God, whatever you want. God, I praise your name. David said this, as a heart panted after the water brooks, so my soul panted after thee, O God. God wants my worship. How's your worship toward God? How's your worship when you read the Bible in the morning or in the evening? Do you worship God? Do you you communicate with God? Do you open God's word and say, God, speak to me. I want to know what you like. God, thank you. Oh, you're a great God. God, I want to praise your name for who you are. God, thank you for your grace. It's greater than all my sin. God, thank you for your care. Do you worship God? Do you come to church? Do you worship God? Or do do you just punch a clock and put your time in? Come to church today and I sit down and stand up when I'm supposed to, sit back down and open my mouth and shut my mouth and close my eyes, open my eyes and then walk out the back door. That's not worship. Worship says, God, what do you have for me today? God, what do you want from me? God, you love me? God, you speak to me? That's worship. And God wants my worship. But I'll tell you this, God wants my things. God wants my things. Matthew 6, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. These things that we have, they ought to belong to God. God, if you want it, you can have it. God, if you want my house, you can have my house. It's yours. God, if you want what's in my checking account, you can have it. It's yours. But because we love ourselves, we hold those things tightly. And we have in our minds this thought that God is just waiting up there and he's like staring at us. And he's waiting for us to say, you can have it. To say, aha, I got it. Yeah, now you have nothing. And we think that. And that God's just waiting to pounce on us. But I read my Bible and I find that God's not waiting to pounce on us. God's waiting to give to us. If I read the Bible, God's waiting to give to us. But he wants our things. I read about Abraham and and God asked him to give up Isaac. Abraham said, okay, I will. And God gave him, at that time, just another ram and then a whole nation. God's waiting to give things. God only want, not only wants my worship, my things, God wants me. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I wonder if you get caught up in the me first attitude. I wonder if you make sure that you give yourself what you need. I wonder if you make sure your boss has what they need, but have you forgotten about God? What he wants, what he needs? About the time that he wants? About the talents that he's given to you? There's more room in the choir for people to sing. Does God want you in the choir? Well, Brother Howell, I could never sing in the choir. You don't understand. I'd ask you if you could or couldn't sing, but if God gave you talent, give it back to God and ask God what he wants you to do with that. And he wants you to sing. We've got classes that need to be taught, and, and maybe God's given you the ability to, to be able to communicate truth. Did you say, hey, Miss Mitchell, you can use me. I'll give, I'll, I'll, render, I'll give to God what's God's. And I'm nervous about it, and I'm scared to death, and I'm afraid I'm going to ruin these kids or whatever, but, but God, you can have. You can have my talent and my teaching. Maybe you're good with kids and you can watch a, someone in the nursery. Oh, they wouldn't want me. But give to God the things that are God's. Maybe he's blessed you financially and you say, God, I give to God the things that are God. Are you giving to God what God desires? Maybe he just wants you to worship him finally. Just slow down and be still. Know that he is God. See, the most important part of this verse, I believe, is that last, this last phrase. Render unto God the things that are God's. And I'm afraid that we often have that order, myself, authority, and finally God. When the order ought to be God. Everything else. Jesus said in John 5.30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
And Paul said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark. Are you given to God what God wants? Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray you'd, that your spirit touch us. Lord, I wonder if there is someone here who your spirit realized that they're more concerned about themselves than they ought to be. Lord, maybe you touched a heart about being concerned about authority more than God. But Lord, I pray that you would touch us this morning. What if there's someone here who would say, you know, Brother Howell, as you spoke, God spoke to me. There's an area in my life that I need to do business with God. Maybe it's with authority, maybe it's with myself or something that God wants that I'm not giving to him. Would you pray for me that I get the right, the right things given to the right place? That I pray saying, would you pray for me this morning? God touched my heart this morning. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. I wonder if there's someone here this morning. And if you were to die today, you're not sure that you'd go to heaven. Oh, you may be a good person and a moral person, but you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. The Bible says the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And what if there's someone here who said, you know, Brother Howell, I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. I'd like to know how. And would you pray for me when you pray with the others? I'm not sure if I die the day that I'd go to heaven, but I'd like to know that. And I'll draw no more attention to you than I did to anyone else who raised their hand. But I would love to pray for you this morning. If there's something like that this morning, just slip it up and slip it back down. I'm not sure I'm on my way to heaven, but I'd like to be sure. Would you pray for me? Amen. When you pray for the others, would you pray for me? Amen. Lord, guide this time. Lord, help us to be honest, respond to you. In Jesus.